everybody. Um, oh, I don't know why the screen has gone uh, black, but um, this is the last in the, the current uh, seminar, uh, semester's seminar series in Geography and Trinity. And I'm very happy to have uh, Aidan Alderson. He's a professor of Indigenous Studies from George Brown College in uh, Toronto, Canada. And particularly glad because it's 8 a.m. Um, in, in Canada or Toronto at the minute. So it's not, not 8 a.m. all across Canada, obviously, but a big place. But um, yes, I wouldn't be able to be giving a talk at, at 8 a.m. So I'm, I'm very extra pleased that Aidan's come. Um, and I came across uh, Aidan's work um, doing some research in my own thinking about kind of the histories of, of empire and colonialism in Ireland. And one of the things I was thinking about in this was the kind of complexities in that with regards to the, the di Irish diaspora in, uh, in North America particularly, but we can also see that in, in other kind of uh, settler colonies from uh, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa as well. And I came across work that I hadn't been doing, which was fantastic on, on this question and kind of the idea of decolonizing the Irish. What does this mean? And kind of posing that that question as has been quite a bit of discussion over the last few years, but making the diaspora and the, the role of, of the diaspora in kind of both the projects of settler colonial uh, projects in you know the North America and Australia largely looking at, but also the role of um, Irish diaspora in kind of resistance and, and international solidarities against that with indigenous uh, peoples in those those, uh, those territories. So that was fantastic, and we had a really interesting chat after that. And uh, and um, uh, he's going to talk today about Irish indigenous relations in the twenty first century, uh, from anti colonial nostalgias to decolonial futures. I'm very excited to hear. Um, about that and we have some people joining us today from other institutions who are in, in other institutions in Ireland, uh, geographers who are interested in issues of, of decolonization with relationship between uh, Ireland and, and other um, uh, contexts as well. So Aidan, I will turn it over to you and, and uh, I will mute myself and if you've got questions you can kind of type them into the chat or at the end, we'll kind of, uh, um, I'll kind of moderate that. But um, if you want to ask them in person, you're, you're welcome to do so. But I'd ask you just to, to, to keep your, any comments for now to the chat. Okay, thanks. Perfect, thank you, Ryan. All right. So Jalasi, welcome everyone. Um, I want to begin by thanking you all for being here today and for inviting me to be part of this year's Trinity College Dublin Geography Seminar Series. My name, as Ray mentioned, is Dr. Aidan Alderson, and I'm an Irish and Mi'kmaq or Indigenous scholar currently working as a professor of Indigenous Studies at George Brown College in Toronto. Over the past six years, I've had the honor of doing research and collaboration with Indigenous communities in Canada, Irish Canadians, and Irish citizens in the Republic and Northern Ireland, as part of my ongoing work exploring the potential for strengthening Irish-Indigenous relations. I also want to acknowledge um, that many of my publications and projects in this area would not have been possible without the support of numerous organizations like the Ireland Kennedy University Foundation, the Social Sciences and Human Humanities Research Council of Canada, and numerous post-secondary institutions in Ireland and Canada. This talk um, today will be broken into three sections. So section one discusses indigenous populations in the USA, Canada, and Australia, alongside a brief snapshot of the current entanglement of the Irish diaspora and Ireland's economies in the territories. Um, in order to highlight the ways that, the, that um, accountable Irish Indigenous relations will require a willingness to risk losing privileges that the Irish have gained from actively supporting settler colonial expansion. Section two explores the way that risk aversion, anti-colonial nostalgia without anti-colonial action, and a general focus on cultural exchange continues to shape the current state of Irish Indigenous relations and how this results in very little change to the role that the Irish are playing in supporting Indigenous decolonization. Section three of the talk argues that to work towards decolonial futures, the Irish need to actively support um, 
sorry, the Irish need to actively dissent from the international community's ongoing denial of the right to decolonization for Indigenous nations within the USA, Canada, and Australia. And it also points to some of the potential that geography can play in forging foundations for future decolonial relations. So throughout this talk, I invite listeners to think about the following questions. What responsibilities do Ireland and the Irish diaspora have to the Indigenous nations whose territories are currently occupied by the settler colonial nation states of the United States, Canada, and Australia? What role can geography play in laying the groundwork for supporting the independence of Indigenous nations in the current era? And finally, how is supporting more accountable Irish-Indigenous relations in the current era linked to broader work around global justice, environmental justice, and the survival of our planet? So in order to give you a better understanding of the context of Indigenous struggles within the United States, Canada, and Australia, I want to begin by highlighting some key facts. The 2020 census in the United States showed that the current size of the indigenous population in the country was over 9.7 million people. And this is just under 3% of the entire population, although twice the, the size of the population of Ireland. The majority are from 14 distinct nations with over 570 federally recognized uh, tribes. And this is a similar number to the amount of nations who existed in the territory prior to colonization. Only 2.3% of the landmass in the United States is currently reserved for Indigenous people, and that's roughly 227,000 kilometers squared out of over 9.8 million kilometers squared. So you can see that this is a very small amount of access to um, sovereignty over their land base. In Canada, the most recent census put the population of federally recognized Indigenous people at 1.8 million people, or 5% of the total population. The coastal regions of the country are recognized in Canada as being completely unseated, with Canada operating without legal possession of the land. And this is um, in Canadian courts referred to as de facto sovereignty rather than de jure or legal sovereignty. And the central parts of the country are covered by treaties that Canada has historically claimed gave up title to the lands but this has recently been debunked in um, numerous um, scholarships that have come out in the past five or so years. Um, there's one book in particular called No Surrender, The Land Remains Indigenous, which looks to archival sources, both from, um, from Europeans and from Indigenous peoples, that show that during the treaties, there was no um, cultural misunderstanding between Europeans and Indigenous people and there was no surrender of the lands. So for the most part, the entire country of Canada is without an actual treaty giving up sovereignty over the land. There are of course modern treaty negotiations because the Crown recognizes that this is the case, um, which are attempting to resolve these issues. Um, but generally speaking, most of the land is unceded. So in spite of this fact, today less than 0.2% of the land base in what is known as Canada is held by Indigenous people. And even within those areas where um, First Nation reserves are, um, the Canadian government still deems themselves as the highest authority. In Australia, the Indigenous population is 984,000 people or 3.8% of the total population. There are 250 distinct linguistic groups, um, kind of the closest approximation to national groups there. And there's a plethora of um, different communities and clans. All of the land in Australia remains unceded and not covered by any treaties. Although there have been some land claims um, that have recently gone through, for example, making it so that 50% of the Northern territories was ceded back to indigenous uh, populations there. So when we're talking about the struggle for liberation of indigenous nations and territories, it's key to recognize just how many nations the Irish could be collaborating with in these efforts. And while the large amount of nations that exist in these territories may seem to present a barrier, it's worth noting that in total, 
These regions comprise over 27.5 million kilometers squared or 17 million miles squared, a landmass that is 342 times the size of the island of Ireland. Historic and ongoing collaborations between the Irish diaspora, Irish governments, and settler governments in these regions are undoubtedly linked to the historic significance of these landscapes as spaces where the Irish were able to feel at home after forcible transportation, fleeing persecution, and historic periods of upheaval like the Irish famine. Within all three settler colonies, transplantations of colonial policies and structures that had previously been enacted on Ireland took place. In the United States, for example, the Irish found themselves aligning with the settler colonial regimes and colonies that were designed to transplant and advance the types of oppression that took place in the Ulster plantation onto foreign lands. In Canada, almost all of the socio-legal strategies that have been used by the British and later Canadian government to attempt to suppress, immobilize, and assimilate Indigenous populations were adapted from previous socio-legal strategies that were imposed on the Irish. Yet the Irish became leading administrators of the British colony. In Australia, where the, the initial populations were forcibly displaced to the continent, Irish populations went on to lead the forcible and violent displacement of Indigenous populations in the frontier wars. We can never know how the missed opportunities for allyship with indigenous decolonization struggles could have led, led to international indigenous populations being able to support Irish independence since the 17th century. What we do know is that historically the Irish have instead focused on comparisons with settler colonists themselves. For example, home ruler Isaac Butts tried to use Canadians as an example of a population gaining home rule that the native Irish populations could emulate. And this was in the 1870s. And this is in spite of Canadians not actually being native to the territory. And the Irish have also played a key role in reframing the recolonization of the Americas by the United States as being a result of anti-colonial in independence movements rather than intercolonial struggles. In all cases, discussions of Irish roles in independence in these areas have precluded the indigenous populations whose lands the Irish have played such a key role in transforming over the past 400 years. There can be little doubt that the settler colonies have persisted as one of the main sites for the Irish. In the present, just under 38 million of the estimated 80 million people in the Irish diaspora currently live in the United States of America, Canada, and Australia making these three settler colonies home to nearly 50% of the entire diasporic population. While the following snapshot of the entanglement of Irish populations and uh, uh, economies in the settler colonies can be interpreted as providing a more informed context for the lack of Irish resistance to the continuation of colonization in these regions, I believe it also points to the huge influence that the Irish might have in the future of transforming these regions. So according to the US Census Bureau, more than 31.49 million residents in the United States identify as Irish. And this makes the Irish the second largest ethnic group in the country, second only to German. Over 140,000 recent newcomers, people born in Ireland are currently residing in the US. And there are an estimated 50,000 undocumented uh, migrants additionally living in the country after the visa has expired. This is an estimate um, that was provided by the government. Each year, 8,000 special visas are also granted to Irish citizens in the form of special visas and exchanges. So given the amount of Irish Americans, it's probably also unsurprising that U.S. born citizens were among the top residents in both Northern Ireland and the Republic in addition to representing the largest dual citizenship group in the Republic. Furthermore, Ireland has become one of the most um, sought after study abroad locations for United States citizens. So we can see that the kind of diasporic flows of um, people who are descendants of the Irish diaspora living in the United States and people who identify as Irish um, coming to Ireland 
um, you know, continue to play a major role in the relationship between Ireland and the settler colony. According to the most recent census information in Canada, over 4.4 million people, or 12% of the entire population of Canada, identify as Irish, making Irish the third largest ethnic group. And this is behind the ambiguous um, ethnic group Canadian and English, which is, so Canadians first and English is second. So when we're thinking about these kind of ambiguous ethnic identities, um, and we know the history of um, the, the initial kind of populations that were in these settler colonies, Canadian could also contain more of the Irish populations as well. In terms of recent newcomers, there are currently 29,300 Irish-born people residing in Canada as documented migrants. Ireland also continues to benefit from an extensive amount of special visas for people both in the Republic and Northern Ireland, including visas for working holidays, young professionals, and international co-op pro co programming. And this is over 10,000 visas allocated for the Irish visitors per year. So you can see that these kind of these relationships between Ireland and Canada um, have been quite strong historically and continue to be quite strong in the present. So the government of Australia's 2021 census showed that the Irish were the third largest ethnic group there, representing 9.5% of residents. That's 2.41 million people. In the case of uh, Australia, much like Canada, this number is probably higher because there were people who claimed to simply be Australian. And when you look at the history of Australia, we know that around the time of Federation and afterwards, um, the Irish population was a very significant population. Um, in fact, there are um, some government um, reports from the government of Australia that say that at least one in three people within the country claim some sort of Irish heritage. Australia also has a particularly high amount of um, newcomers from Ireland with 85,860 Irish born people residing in Australia. Um, and the government also estimates that there's over a thousand undocumented people um, from Ireland still residing in the country. Like the other settler colonies, Ireland continues to benefit from these special visa agreements with Australia. There's been um, in the past year, 3,280 3, 12 month working holiday visas and 233 Irish student visas granted. So the histor historical and current prominence of Irish populations in the United States, Canada and Australia is likely also directly responsible um, for these um, long-standing economic partnerships between the regions. While in recent years, many Irish populations have celebrated um, Ireland's historic and at recent attempts to engage in divestment campaigns to support occupied territories. And you can see, for example, the Kilmain Jail exhibit that was recently um, kind of set a couple of years ago celebrating the Irish role in South African independence or the Occupied Territories Bill of 2018 that worked to officially adopt the BDS movement in, um, in Ireland. Um, beyond the large Irish diasporic population, however, the following economic overviews of partnerships with the settler colonies help to provide a clear picture of why this strategy has never been attempted in relation to the current occupation of Indigenous territories in the United States, Canada, or Australia. In fact, it's, it's rarely ever discussed. So partnering with the United States um, and US owned businesses remains one of Ireland's most important economic strategies. And they continue to consistently produce a huge trade surplus in their goods while also producing a trade deficit that kind of balances out um, that surplus while allowing Ireland to access things like patents um, and copyright um, through uh, trade and services. Additionally, in Northern Ireland, the United States is the second largest importer of goods, and it remains the UK's largest trade partner and a substantial exporter of services to the UK. Um, so Ireland is also part of these broader uh, trade agreements between both the UK um, and the USA, 
and the EU and the USA. Okay, when it comes to foreign direct investment, um, which is attracted by you know a lot of the tax regimes and also these uh, these ongoing trade agreements that are happening, the US represented 59% of all foreign direct investment in Ireland. And this is probably not news to many of you who are here who are geography faculty members, um, but this is substantial with 900 companies employing um, 200,000 employees and it representing a huge amount of uh, money being exchanged within the economy. On the other hand, there's also over 200 billion euros of Irish foreign direct in investment in the US. And um, currently the US reports that there's 110,000 employees employed at Irish firms. Um, and of course, there's significant flows of tourism between both countries. This has lulled a little bit um, since the pandemic, but normally the, the tourism from the US to Ireland is one of the largest um, contributors to the tourist industry. So also, um, when we're looking at Canada, we can see that there are strong um, relationships economically, right? So Ireland's economic partnerships with Canada remain somewhat crucial. Um, there's a 1.7 billion euro trade surplus in goods in the most recent year, and a 1 billion euro service trade surplus. And both countries benefit from the Can Canada European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. Canada is also a crucial source of tourism for Ireland in both the Republic and Northern Ireland. Um, and is sometimes promoted as being um, one of the main populations that will visit both countries. Um, I think they said one in four of Canadians who visit uh, the Republic also visit Northern Ireland. Well, there's a smaller source of foreign direct investment um, in Ireland compared with the United States. This number is continuing to grow. And um, as of 2018, there were uh, 15,000 employees who were employed at Canadian firms. I was looking for a more recent statistic on this, but I, I didn't actually find one. Um, Irish uh, foreign direct investment also plays a key role in Canada's economy and actually um, represented the 15th largest investment in the Canadian market worth approximately 4 billion euros. So you can see that this is, this is again, a, a kind of entanglement with the settler colonies, um, which would be very difficult to engage in a strategy like boycott divestment um, strategies when it comes to supporting Indigenous nations. Also, um, when we're looking at the Australian Ireland economic snapshot here, um, you can see that there was a 1.2 billion euro goods trade surplus and a 1 billion euro service trade surplus, a total amount of 2.2 billion euros. Um, and this was in 2020. Irish investment also represented the 16th largest contributor to Australian econo economies in um, foreign direct, direct investment. So this is a huge amount of, um, of money and it represented um, 24 billion euros. Um, Australian direct foreign, uh, foreign direct investment, apologies on the slide, also represented 12, 20 billion euros in investment in Ireland. Um, and while there is no free trade agreement um, between Australia and the Republic, Northern Irish inclusion in the free trade agreement between the UK and Australia um, does represent a link around these free trade partnerships with Australia. Beyond simply being a matter of reciprocal investment from businesses or national governments, Ireland's involvement in the International Sister Cities program also points to more local scales of entanglement with the settler colonies of the United States, Canada, or Australia. There's over 30 Irish municipalities participating in the program, including locations all over Ireland like Killarney, Bantry, and Dublin. And these municipal partnerships agree to promote economic ties with local towns and cities in the settler colonies. So I wanna to return to that first question that I asked at the beginning of this talk. And given the entanglement of the Irish within these settler colonies, what responsibilities does Ireland and the Irish diaspora have to indigenous nations whose territories are currently occupied by the settler colonial nation states 
of the United States, Canada, and Australia. Given the context provided in the previous section, it should be obvious that there is a great deal of consistency in the profitability and privilege that is gained from Irish participation and colonization, both in the diaspora um, and as international partners with the colonies. To this end, avoidance of explicitly framing Irish Indigenous relations as being in support of the independence of Indigenous territories and nations might be conceptualized as being a form of risk aversion. Similarly, these global exchanges of populations and economic flows and outputs, right, might offer some insight into part of the reasoning behind the lack of agreement around recognizing Ireland as a previously colonized country, beyond, of course, the complicated intergenerational legacies that communities in Ireland have been navigating around their own independence movements. Addressing these issues could pose an opportunity for concretely decolonial mutual recognitions between Ireland as a formerly colonized country and indigenous nations as currently occupied countries. And this is a kind of framing that you don't often see in kind of international relations or um, even representations of indigenous nations within geography. So the title of this talk is in part a response to one of the most common experiences that I continue to have with Irish diaspora members. And this, this kind of conversation emerges when I'm on social media, it emerges in my classrooms, and it emerges at cultural events where Indigenous peoples invite people to think about what they're going to do to uphold their responsibilities to Indigenous peoples. In the settler colonies, it's extremely common to see members of the Irish diaspora bringing discussions about their natural affinity with Indigenous nations, being rooted in their heritage as members of a population who have engaged in centuries of anti-colonial struggle against the British. Well, it hopefully goes without saying that this kind of anti-colonial nostalgia flattens the diverse and conflictive relationships that the Irish have historically had, both to the British and to colonialism and empire. Perhaps even more importantly, these types of articulations make the Irish diaspora members feel like their presence is an anti-colonial presence in indigenous lands, in spite of being among the largest intergenerational settler populations in territories like the USA, Canada, and Australia. The point of flagging this as problematic is not to discuss that many of the concrete links, or not to discount rather, that many of the concrete links between Irish and Indigenous struggles exist, but only to point out the way in which these types of assertions are often used as assertions of allyship without taking on any inherent risk that might come with actual support for decolonization struggles. And these decolonization struggles continue to involve great deals of danger for Indigenous peoples in these same territories. So within Ireland itself, there's an incredibly exciting momentum building around collaborations between Irish and Indigenous peoples. Um, but most of this work is being done in a way that's rooted in ideas about cultural exchange, which is still valuable, but not necessarily decolonial. So some examples of recent and current initiatives include the work being done by the Ireland Kennedy University Foundation, who to their credit um, also invested in my research um, examining the impacts of colonialism in both Ireland and in First Nations communities in Canada. But the Ireland Kennedy University Foundation is a joint partnership between, um, well, I mean, it's, it's an organization, but it's jointly funded by the, um, the Irish government and the Canadian government. And so they promote linkages between these two countries um, while also being engaged in these kind of cultural exchange programs. So one really exciting um, program that was created, and I think actually has a lot of potential for sharing worldviews and you know, potentially influencing um, decolonial work was this language immersion and exchange that they created between Mohawk reserves in Canada and the Gaeltacht in, in Ireland. So they had people um, getting to go to both places and being immersed in um, Gaelga and in um, Mohawk language. 
There's also an ongoing partnership that the ICUF has with UCD and University of Manitoba for the annual land speed gatherings. And this kind of um, uh, cultural gathering is supposed to be rooted in celebration um, and peace and kind of cultural exchange. And you can see how like this is wonderful in many regards. There's an exchange of um, kind of traditional music, um, poetry, um, kind of writing, a, a bunch of different things like that. There's even discussions of sport. Um, but even the concept of rooting an exchange in the idea of peace, well, I can understand where this is coming from in the context of, um, of you know, Ireland and um, being in this post Good Friday Agreement era and you know, an investment in anti-violence. Um, the assumption that peace can be had in places like North America, where the indigenous communities are coming from and are still being put through um, numerous forms of cultural genocide and numerous forms of uh, colonial oppression, um, it kind of precludes the broader discussion of how those um, collaborations could be supporting indigenous sovereignty. On the other hand, there's another exciting initiative that I wanted to share, which is the Making Relatives Collective. And you know, similar to Rory reaching out to me for this talk, um, due to my some of the work that I've written before, I was actually put in touch with some of the organizers in this collective, and they're from um, NUI Galway's geography department, and they're working in partnership with Indigenous water protectors from Standing Rock. And part of what they were planning on doing prior to the pandemic was to bring them to Ireland and kind of take them around to meet community partners um, and to have a broader discussion about resisting resource extraction, um, both in Ireland and in North America. And this kind of partnership, right, um, I think lends itself more to a discussion of the continued impacts of colonialism, both locally and globally, um, in terms of the way that we approach the planet and the environment. I also want to highlight some current Irish Indigenous collaborations between the Irish diaspora and Indigenous nations. So there's a, a, an organization or a kind of informal organization called Irish Grounded Connections. And this is a collective of Irish community members in the United States who host traditional rambling houses where they come together, discuss liberatory topics, including allyship with Indigenous nations. They gather different things to read, different things to listen to. And then they kind of just brainstorm together. And this is one of those spaces that really has been producing um, some anti-colonial allyship, um, as well as um, some, some concrete strategies for how to approach uh, solidarity work with Indigenous communities. Similarly, um, there is a broader um, historical linkages project that's being undertaken by Indigenous and non-Indigenous community members in New Brunswick. And they include members who are Irish, um, Acadian, and Mi'kmaq. But what they're looking at is the interwoven histories of European settlers in the area and the indigenous communities. And they're doing some really fantastic work in terms of kind of uncovering those connections um, that can be used to promote accountability between different communities in Canada. And these are just a, a few of the selections of the things that um, I've been privileged to kind of encounter in my work looking at Irish Indigenous relations. Um, we can, of course, think of um, more public uh, celebrations of Solidarity Acts, for example, with Ireland, you know, withdrawing from the lacrosse um, tournament because they wouldn't accept Haudenosaunee passports. Um, when the Haudenosaunee travel, they use their own passports rather than settler colonial passports. And the Haudenosaunee are, are a nation that span between both the United States and Canada. Um, and Ireland kind of stood on the right side of this, I believe, and uh, uh, really kind of took a stand. And that, you know, these kind of these kind of moments represent kind of insights into what um, you know decolonial partnerships might look like in the future. So in 2019, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to publish the article, Decolonizing the Irish, the International Resistance and Entrenchment of the Global Irish Diaspora. 
And I published this in Studies Ireland as his um, special issue on the global Irish diaspora. And within it, I put forward a call to members of the Irish diaspora and our kin in Ireland, um, you know, being a descendant of the diaspora myself, to reorient discussions of decolonization towards global rather than national liberations. It's my hope that some of what I've shared today will contribute to conveying the urgency of this type of orientation. Because I believe that in spite of the ways that the Irish have benefited from participation in colonialism, there's a disproportionate amount to be gained from Irish indigenous relations, beginning to center the work of resisting colonization and the misrecognition of indigenous sovereignty. So I want to also point to a note around the, the urgency of supporting indigenous sovereignties and indigenous nationalisms. So unlike most contemporary forms of ethno-nationalism or nation states, indigenous national traditions are rooted in kind of deeply intergenerational relationships and responsibilities which dictate deep accountability with the earth and non-human kin. And this is a point that's reiterated by the fact that indigenous people are currently known to be protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity within their territories. So for those of us who are interested in how collaborations between geographers can help to work towards global environmental justice, economic justice, or the work that needs to be done to navigate the current climate crisis, we would do well to take up this work of supporting indigenous sovereignties. And in fact, even in areas that are predominantly um, areas that settlers live in, whenever there is um, a, an ecological system that is uh, being threatened by resource extraction, um, it's always indigenous people who are at the front line of resisting this kind of extraction. So um, when we're supporting indigenous sovereignty, we're also supporting the planet. Like the Irish, indigenous communities in the United States, Canada, and Australia have a long experience of, of a long history of experiencing dehumanization, deficit narratives, so narratives that said they were not able to govern themselves, and stereotyping that were used to justify refusing to end the denial of the right of Indigenous nations to control their own territories. Irish people really have an opportunity to find points of empathy between their own histories. As a people who have experienced this, if you look at Irish history, and you look at the debates that took place around whether or not the Irish could govern themselves, this kind of history of dehumanization and deficit narratives are very, very, very clearly a part of that history. So there's, there's an opportunity to look at Irish histories and the history of Indigenous nations and to recognize the lack of legitimacy of colonial control over current Indigenous territories. And in so doing, there's also an opportunity to think about forging new bilateral and multilateral agreements with the nations whose lands the diaspora have been living on for so many centuries now. And I almost included in this talk a question around how many of you could name one of the treaties within these settler colonies. But because I didn't want to expect you to have any prior knowledge, I didn't want to include that. But these are questions that people should be asking themselves who are involved in the global Irish diaspora, because most of these territories have original agreements with Indigenous people that just haven't been upheld. And the spirit and intent of those agreements really offers a pathway forward um, for good partnerships in the future. So I wanted to briefly give an overview of the denial of the right to decolonization. And I'm aware that we're kind of short on time here, so I'll try to, I'll try to be quick around this. But in the 1960s, um, Indigenous in the United States, Canada, and Australia, um, since the 1960s, have experienced this, um, this denial of the right to decolonization. And what happened was after World War II, there was a shift away from using dehumanization as the justification to exert control over colonial populations. And the United Nations adopted this Declaration on Decolonization. So supposedly this resolution was designed to mark the United Nations members agreeing to the formal end of colonialism um, for all territories whose people had not yet attained a full measure of self-government. However, United Nations member states like Canada, um, you know, like the United States were able to look at this clause that said, um, you could be recognized as achieving self-government through emergence as a sovereign independent state, which did not happen for indigenous peoples, free association with an independent state, 
which they argued was happening but wasn't actually happening, or integration with an independent state. And in this case, the three settler colonial nations that we're discussing through forced mechanisms of assimilation and presuming indigenous nationals as subjects successfully argued that indigenous people are integrated. And so they were, they were kind of excluded from the right to decolonization. There's also the blue water rule, which was used to argue that only um, places that were colonized by a foreign power that was separated by ocean should be considered allowed to decolonize. And the denial of this being the case with places like Canada coincided with a move within Canadian politics to remove references to Canada being a British colony. In the 21st century, there's a continuous assertion of Indigenous sovereignty, and it resulted in things like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And we can see that this affirms numerous rights for Indigenous people, including the right to self-determination. However, it also includes this Article 46.1, which says nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, people, group, or person, any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act contrary to the Charter of the United Nations or authorizing or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. That right there is a denial of the right to decolonization hidden right within the document that's celebrated as being the kind of leading document um, supporting indigenous sovereignty. So as we pass the many centenaries that mark the journey of Ireland becoming recognized as a nation among nations, this era represents an ideal time for Ireland to look to other territories of the planet that have not yet been afforded the same recognition by the international community. Ireland is not a burgeoning country in the international community at risk of losing its recognition as a sovereign state for doing so. And thus, when it comes to Irish Indigenous relations, I want to leave you with the argument the main pathway forward for decolonial futures is to engage in everyday acts of dissent from the international community's ongoing denial of Indigenous sovereignty and the right to decolonization in the current settler colonies. So linking my argument with the work being done at Trinity College Dublin, I want to turn to question number two. And again, I'm gonna try to speed through this. Um, so what role can geography play in laying the groundwork for supporting the independence of indigenous nations in the current area or era? The reality is that geography plays a key role in shaping the worldviews of people at both local and international levels. And the, the representations of indigenous territories put forward by geographers have the potential to either disrupt or affirm colonial claims to legitimacy in a variety of different ways. Some of the ways that I've taken up in my own work has been through combining oral history research with geographical representations that afford territories like Mi'kma'ki, which is the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq, the same level of recognition as Ireland and cartographic and demographic representations. I've used maps, current population and GDP information um, within that territorial unit um, as a way of, of kind of treating it as its own area, even though in the international community, it's seen as part of Canada. I also used illustrations to help readers conceptualize why Mi'kmaq is a territory that's worthy of comparison with Ireland, like the following sketch, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, that shows the comparative size of Mi'kmaq at the same scale of Ireland. So you can see it's actually much bigger. So there's numerous under-researched areas that can contribute to Irish Indigenous relations and understandings of Ireland and Indigenous territories that geographers can help to explore, some of which I'm interested in contributing to. Um, and so there's further research on Irish involvement in the initial resource extraction in the Americas that fueled the Industrial Revolution, comparative examinations of environmental transformations in Ireland and abroad under colonial regimes, impacts on the Irish uh, environment during the time period known as the Great, Di Great Dying, which produced a mini ice age due to loss of life in the Americas. Survey research examining the Irish understanding of relationships to Indigenous nations and lands at a broader scale. And this is a project that I was actually awarded federal funding to undertake before having to withdraw in order to take on my current faculty position. And explorations of Indigenous and Irish kinship networks and their relationships to land in Ireland and the settler colonies. So while there continues to be growing interest in collaborations between Ireland, the Irish diaspora and indigenous communities, the potential that 21st century Irish indigenous relations have to reach a state of decolonial accountability and reciprocity remains untapped. It's my hope that this talk has pointed to some of the ideas that might motivate 
a shift towards a future where the Irish and Indigenous nations are able to collaborate, problem solve, and work through the uncomfortable and unfamiliar territory that will come through substantively supporting global decolonization. In doing so, I believe we have the potential to make our generation one that's remembered for our contributions to building on the legacy of shared histories of struggle, addressing historic injustices, ending reliance on settler colonialism locally and internationally, and working towards a foundation of co-learning that can be used to ensure that all nations are free from colonial occupation once and for all. So Walelio, thank you all for being here and for taking the time to be here with me. Um, if you want to connect to talk about this talk or Irish Indigenous relations more broadly, you're very welcome to email me at aiden.alderson at georgebrown.ca. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Aiden. And uh, that was a challenging and uh, beautiful, I would say, as, a, as I find your the essay that I previously read. I'm really disappointed to, to say that uh, one of the, their guests that enjoyed this uh, is uh, Vincenza from NUI Goway, who's part of the Making Relatives Collective. But she oh just my. wrote in the, she just wrote in the chat that uh, she has to leave already. To thank you so much for a really interesting talk. So uh, that that sucks. I was hoping that uh, Vincenza, she was very keen to, to join today, and, and that's uh, so cool. <laughs> uh, but maybe I, I can put you you both in touch, and because uh, I think you've lots to to talk about um, there. And um, I will go ahead. There's a question from from Iris Muller, who's the the head of uh, Department of Geography. He types into the chat here. I'll just read it so that everyone can hear it. Uh, Thank you for a really interesting seminar, Aidan. I fully agree, of course, in the role of geography and all of this is so important. And it'll be great to see how these ideas you outlined come to fruition. I'm very sorry I have to run to another commitment, but thanks so much. Okay, so not, not a question, <laughs> but I will invite questions from the remaining members. Yeah. Of the I, have, I have several myself. If you want to ask a question um, through the microphone, of course, please do. It's, it's, I think there's a sufficient number of us that we can have a nice discussion. Otherwise, you can type it in the chat. I know not everyone is. This time of the day, people are kind of often stuffing some lunch into their face in their office or something. I want to thank you again for, for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm very happy to be here. Patrick, I see your hand up. I think you you can just jump in. Patrick, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not going to turn. I'm doing what Roy just mentioned. I was <laughs> shoving lunch into my face. So, <laughs> but um, so that was awesome. It was really, really interesting. Um, the, the one thing that I kind of wanted to ask a little bit about was the inclusion of the North and some of those economic uh, statistics, you know, um, just in terms of like thinking about, you know, like the very, very material differences between, you know, let's say the establishment of, you know, the free state and, you know, the status of the North is still a dominion of the UK, right? Mm -hmm. um, just so, you know, and obviously, you know, I know that you're trying to traverse a whole lot of scales with, some, you know, with a 45 minute talk, right? So these sorts of things are really difficult to, you know, sort of uh, cram into to a short time. But I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how that, how those relationships between, let's say, the North within, you know, so with these kind of internal geographies in Ireland might play into how you think, how you think about the, you know, kind of decolonial futures and the futures of kind of like decolonial solidarity between uh, between these two places. Thanks so much again. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I hope I, I can come up with an adequate answer for that. I, I, I spent some time when I was doing my PhD dissertation, and it's it's going to be a book later this year, but I was doing oral history research in the border towns between Donegal and Derry. And um, I, I spent a little bit of time in the North during that time period. Um, and when it comes to these ideas around um, decolonial work, I found that um, that there's a, a hesitancy, and I didn't want to I didn't want to hash it out too much in this book because again I was I was aware of time, um, but there's a hesitancy to talk about um, about colonialism as a frame in general, um, and I think that that is. It, it's related to a number of things. I think one, it's related to kind of uh, in some ways honoring the fact that there are Irish people who just do believe that they're British or who do believe that um, since the act of union um, that, you know, Ireland had this, this great opportunity and who see it in a completely different lens than a lot of the kind of anti-colonial um, nationalist writings um, would present it. Um, but I think also a lot of it has to do with uh, maybe risk aversion, like this idea of how do people process trauma? How do people process knowing that within their communities, there's family members who um, were involved in feuds that could quite easily 
um, reemerge. So in terms of like the material differences, of course, I mean, the, the, the Northern Irish um, state in general um, has been able to rely on the economic benefits of being in union with the UK. I mean, this is, this is uh, well known in the North. And actually one of the things that, uh, that kept reemerging in these conversations I was having with community members is people would be very um, nationalist or very pro-unification in terms of like what they, um, what they thought would look nice in terms of uh, a decolonial future for Ireland. But they would laugh and they would say it would never happen because they would even 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 these people themselves would not want to give up the benefits that they have um, in terms of the bread and butter issues and the supports that they have um, from being part of the UK. So I think there's there's a lot of different kind of dynamics at play when it comes to um, looking at um, kind of Irish perspectives of decolonization when you're at when you're when you're thinking about Northern Ireland versus say the Republic. Um, but yeah, this this hesitancy to talk about colonialism in general is um, almost the exact inverse of my experience dealing with diaspora members, because in, in the diaspora, I think that they're and it's kind of one of these funny things, because, um, I, you know, one of my one of my um, advisors had said that <laughs> she thinks that a lot of it is just people get their their ideas around these issues from media. And I think that there's something to be said about that in terms of that anti-colonial nostalgia that, that emerges in conversations with, um, with Irish diaspora members who aren't maybe hearing uh, about these struggles from parents or grandparents who are necessarily a part of them, right? Um, and so there's, there's a much more, um, there's a much more readily, um, readily uh, kind of available discussion of, you know, oh, we have these natural links uh, in anti-colonialism with people who weren't necessarily at the heart of the, 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 the kind of impacts of the partition and the struggles that, that emerged out of that. Um, and there's a much more cautious, I think, um, type of discussion that takes place when you're up in Northern Ireland or by the borders. And maybe Rory can speak to this more than I can, you know, um, in terms of experience uh, with Northern Ireland, but that's been my experience around, um, around these differences. So I think that, um, you know, that's one aspect of it. And then also to answer your other question of like thinking about decolonial futures, there's, there's the question of what would happen if uh, places like Canada or Australia were dismantled. Like, what would the UK do in that in that situation, right? So, um, what what would be the pressure on um, Northern Ireland citizens or Northern Irish citizens um, in the case that there was an actual um, abolition mm -hmm. of of colonization within these Commonwealth countries? Because you know, regardless of the fact that I mean regardless of the fact that Canada did a lot of different things to remove their public discussions of being a British colony after the 1960s. And again, much of this was related to um, not wanting to be decolonized. Um, you know, we're still very much uh, part of the King's Privy Council and having meetings with uh, the monarchy and, you know, playing playing kind of formal roles with the monarchy. And I think that there's a, there's a, um, there's a lack of general understanding when it comes to the Canadian public around the amount of, um, of relationships that still exist with the UK. Um, you know, just as someone who lives in Canada, that's what I can speak to because I don't live in, in, in Australia in that context. But I'd be curious to see what would happen in terms of Northern Ireland. Um, were there a resistance to, or like a, an attempt to end um, our monarchy rule in uh, in in Canada, so I think perhaps more uh, likely in the short term than the dispersal of the nation states of mm. not not so much the question of you know kind of totally um, leaving the Commonwealth or something and um, finishing its formal decolonization as a as a um, a formal colony 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 um, like the breakup of the UK as a as a state is you know it's it's much muted I think it, somewhat exaggerated but it is possible the Scottish independence moves to to unify Ireland happening at the same time and um what would happen in what possibilities would that release in uh the horizon of the possibilities you've kind of sketched out for kind of yeah. 
Irish indigenous relations in, in the settler colonial context. I mean, I, I think there's a common thing in the Republic rather than the, the, the North so much to, to speak is that colonization, and this, this seems to chime discussions that happen in the Republic of Ireland with some of the things that, that are, you say about the Irish diaspora in, in Canada in your experience. Um, colonization is fine to acknowledge and to critique when it's in history or it's mm -hmm. elsewhere. It's displaced in time or place. Yeah. And there's a huge resistance to talking about it as something that still exists in uh, the North because of, uh, you know, I think the, the legacy of the conflict there, but also that bears on an inability to talk about its legacies in the present in mm -hmm. Ireland, as well as, as, as say, in, the, in the, the work that you're doing about what it means to think about the Irish diaspora in that way. I mean, and this, this is the thing, it's, it's not a question, but more a, a kind of comment. And I think it's a thing to, to worth thinking through. So there's kind of, what, what do we mean by decolonization? And there's the kind of, there's the formal decolonization of getting an independent sovereignty. And, and of course, I uh, realize that, you know, I speak from a position of privilege, but being a citizen of a independent sovereign state, which is, you know, ind indigenous nations are, are not uh, in even more extremely. So in the case of Canada than the United States, as, as you really nicely um, laid out, but that formal decolonizing of say the Irish Republic does not go the full way. And there's many ways, not just the, the rump statelet of Northern Ireland and how, how that's, but there's an unfinished process of decolonization and, and kind of, I guess there's conversations starting here and, and Patrick and other Patrick who's here and Vincenza um, are part of the conversations of trying to think, well, what does it mean to think through these really difficult questions of how is decolonization unfinished and what would it mean to think about it beyond? And in fact, actually some of the, the those cultural things that you point to as being kind of slightly woolly in a way, that's actually some of the place where we're finding, this is like questions of language, for example, and, and yeah. uh, it's not necessarily about territory, but also the economic sphere is a, a crucial thing. Um, and those economic relationships that are perhaps neo-colonial and were never, were never decolonized and so on. But I, I think the type of thing that you're talking about is this possibility of, decolonial solid kind of extending historical decolonial solidarities into this as you said potential for irish descent in mm -hmm. the global colonial system we can think about that not only as irish diaspora or irish citizens taking up their responsibilities with regard to indigenous populations but also taking up the question of finishing the decolonization here and maybe yeah. that's part of part of the how it's done this yeah, I didn't. I I didn't want to overreach in my talk, but I was thinking about that when I was writing it because because there was something, something that occurred to me when I was talking about that that ability to dissent, to dissent and how that's linked to sovereignty itself, mm -hmm. right? Like, what does it mean to be a country that can offer recognition to other countries, and what does it mean to be a country that has to think about whether it can offer recognition to other countries? Mm -hmm or places that aren't even considered countries. Mm -hmm. Like who, who gets to grant the power of mm -hmm. being considered a country? And I think if we're to look at that, we'll see that it's still very much the colonial old guard, like in terms of the nation states mm -hmm. um, who, who form these multilateral institutions and have the most wealth, which is like an inherited wealth. It's legacies of colonialism, of slavery, of neoliberal extraction, right? Um, and I think you know what you're speaking about in terms of incomplete decolonization is something that's so important because um, you know Ireland in a lot of ways got the jump, right? So a lot of places, this was like 1960s, mm -hmm. like late 1950s to the early 1970s, when when places were finally getting formal independence, um, and they they also ended up in these neo-colonial relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know many of my my colleagues from uh, places around Asia and Africa you know, we'll say like decolonization failed in their eyes. That's what they'll say. Um, but I think that um, that there's an, there's an opportunity when looking at um, countries like Ireland and, and countries like those in Africa and Asia and, and Latin America that engage in these, um, these incomplete decolonizations um, to learn how to do it properly. Mm -hmm. like, or to think about like what steps might be needed to take for us to take to do this on a global scale and to actually end these legacies once and for all. I don't, I don't know that um, that that's been done yet, and and I think that it's something that um, becomes more and more pressing um, with the link between environmental collapse and capitalism mm -hmm. and colonial legacies because those things are um, they seem to be kind of. Uh, becoming more intensified over time rather than uh, rather than easing up on each other, right?
Um, are there any other questions from the, the audience? Patrick, if you if you want to, to, to ask again. Yeah, I think I think those um those questions about what, what does decolonization mean, you know, and, and it, it yeah. yes, sure it means formal sovereignty, but that's a limited conception of what it means, which is not to say that that's an unimportant or it's somehow secondary to other things. It's it's a that is a kind of almost like a I was gonna say platform, that's not the right word, but it's like it's a it's an aspect or a a, like a tool that can be used to leverage other aspects such as cultural aspect and, and the environment of course is is key you know what do you do with that sovereignty what is the content exactly. of, yeah. of that decision making capacity that that is is granted i mean one, one of the things that's come up at the minute which is interesting also vis-a-vis -vis the canadian nation state in the united states and, and australia for that matter australia also yes is nato and uh you know there's long been was one of the you know some would say it's the the own the only true solidly kind of sovereign act of ireland as a decol decolonial nation not just an independent but one which acts in the in the in the vein of decolonization within the global sphere is the irish neutrality and refusal to join nato or other um security alliances it is part of the united nations peacekeeping um in, in various places but uh, this is this is under question at the minute, and it's it's kind of it's part of the constitution, but worded in a way which is ambiguous um, as to the nature of that neutrality and what it means. And so this has become, since the war in Ukraine, very much on the table. There was people wanting to push for this to be uh, brought onto the um, to be debated again, um, and so a debate has started about what that means. And it's it's interesting that the only people who are linking that to the kind of tradition of Ireland as a kind of decolonial state um, are kind of fringe elements of like anti-imperialist kind of left mm -hmm. who are often you know, routinely dismissed as yeah. uh, uh, but actually uh, it, when they do these like polls the newspaper mainstream they do polls it has huge purchase on the on the, the population um, who may not be you know if you ask them the same poll about you know do they feel colonized and some they will you know they'll not say this but this is a kind of it has key purchase that ireland is not a, a warfaring country and doesn't want to be part of neo-imperial alliances um so that that is a lot of public purchase on the, on the population but the government are pushing to and it's one of those areas where like this could be framed in various ways but one of the ways to frame it is this act of not just you know completing or leaning into the the formal decolonization that ireland as a state has a nation state has achieved but also in terms of alliances we don't want to be part of processes of going to to fight you know yeah and i think that, and wars. there's there's something there's something to be said also just about the way that that's also linked to those legacies of intergenerational trauma that are still persisting right like my work with community members um people were just a either like mortified at some of the things that they recounted when they were remembering what it was like growing up or or you know very much like framing either side of of these conflicts as being just you know things that should have been avoided in the first place mm -hmm. you know there should there should not have been violence and that's it and so i think that that's um when you're, when you're talking about because ireland you know had had the war of independence had the civil war had the troubles you know has had um so many of these like like paramilitary conflicts etc these are these are these are regions of uh like of the world that have actually experienced what war brings to people mm -hmm. and so i think there's a there's a difference between that and a lot of um a lot of um and, and i agree that you know maybe as an act of sovereignty saying that no we don't want we don't want to join that um is part of that but i think there is a there's a more, and not to discount that there are, of course, some people who are violent, but I'm just saying like, there is a, a broad, in my experience, um, uh, cultural move to to reject violence as, as a method for social transformation mm -hmm. because of the history of the past hundred years where so many people have suffered because of taking that route um, in Irish culture. Mm -hmm. That's something that I've noticed at least, so. I don't know if that's that if that if that statement tracks, but I'm you know just in my own experience. Mm. I mean, often these things are kind of a the types of sentiments that shape that that are raised by policy discussions or events that that raise up these kind of sentiments which exist and circulate in the society, but they are they don't have, uh, focal points until there's like a moment of contestation, and and that's when they become more legible. You know, these these yeah. 
So this is, you know, the neutrality debate was one of those. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time we've gone, I've gone a bit over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, thank you so much for your, your, uh, your talk. It was excellent. And I'm going to stop the recording, but maybe we can uh, stay and have a little sure. for a minute if you're still free. Yeah. So I will do that. Thank, thank you. you so much. I remember how to turn it off. Where is the <laughs> stop recording? Here we go.